And what I would do typically, this would be a little puzzle that I'd give the students. And, and most of them, you know, come to a rough sketch that looks about like this pretty soon. And we don't even attach a name to it at this point. I want to emphasize that this is, again, eighth grade. And in, 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 many, in many cases, people look and they say, well, Waldorf education, we start things a little bit late. This is eighth grade, and we're actually introducing something that I know to me was never introduced, I don't think, until I was in 10th or 11th grade. And this is what's called the conic sections. And this particular shape is called a parabola. A parabola is a very interesting form that appears in nature. In fact, if I take a piece of chalk, in this case, or if I took a, a, a soccer ball and I kicked it, it goes in the arc of a parabola. Here we go. We're going to do a little parabola here. Ready? And, and so anything like that. I also think of it sometimes as uh, if you take a water fountain that's really way too powerful and the water fountain suddenly shoots like this and, it, and then it's a continuous stream of water, that'll be a nice perfect parabola that you'll see. It's very nice. Um, so what I'm going to do is jump ahead because what I would do at the end of this first day is I'd say, okay, how can we now construct this exactly? How can we come up with a method for constructing this parabola with a compass and a straight edge, of course, in a very exact way? And so I'm going to ask you to do, I'm giving you a little bit of a clue because we're racing this ahead. And I just handed out a piece of paper. And I want you to flip that piece of paper. And you will see the method to do this. And in fact, what I would like you to do is the, the line, the fence is down here. The tree is where? It's at the center of all these circles. Can you now use this? And you can imagine doing this with a compass and straight edge, can't you? A series of circles, a series of lines, that's doable. And now what I'd like you to do is to see if you can locate what? All of the points that are equally far from the tree. Why don't you just color in the tree there nice and bright with a colored pencil or something so it stands out. And you want to find all of the places such that you could be standing and you would be equally far from both the tree and the fence. And there are multiple points. And then what are you going to do with all those points? You're going to connect them. It's kind of like you go to the restaurant and you get the little kitty menu, connect the dots. But this is much more interesting. So how many places can you locate on your drawing such that you are exactly equally far from the tree and the fence? Let's imagine each of the lines are one centimeter apart, may even be true. Yeah? So if the lines are one centimeter apart, ask yourself at each place, how many centimeters are you from both? I would be willing to bet, I may be wrong, but I'd be willing to bet that everyone in this room first experienced, the first time that they ever experienced a parabola in math class was this. Yeah? It's a very different experience, isn't it? It's this, you know, here's the y-axis. Here's the x-axis. If this is 5, and this is 5, and this is negative 5, then one of the solutions to the equation is 0, comma 0. One of the solutions to the equation is 1, comma 1, right about there. 2, comma 4, right? Also negative, etc and then we get a parabola. Is this a good thing to do? Absolutely. Everyone should experience Cartesian geometry graphing parabolas, and we do. This is earlier. This is how the Greeks discovered, they, this doesn't come along until you know, the middle of the 1600s. 2,000 years earlier almost, the Greeks are studying yeah, maybe not exactly through this drawing, but through drawing, through their imagination, discovering things about the conic sections. If this is my fence, and this is my tree, then clearly if I am right here, I am one if we're defining this as one, whatever, one foot, I'm one foot from the fence and one foot from the tree. If I'm here, I'm two from both. 
Where would I be five from both? Here's the logic we use in this. Where, where could I be five from both? Well, if I happen to be standing along this line right here, anywhere along this line, do you agree that I am anywhere on that line? I am five feet from the fence. Anywhere along that line. I'm five feet from the fence. Well, do you agree if I'm anywhere along this circle that I am five feet from the tree? Anywhere there. If I'm anywhere along this circle, I'm five feet from the tree. If I'm anywhere along this line, I'm five feet from the fence. So where am I? Five feet from both. Well, it's right there where they intersect. So that's kind of the logic of how that works. It's a very nice thing. And out of this, we can draw a very exact parabola. What does this have to do with the trans transformation of geometry? What does it have to do with the curve in movement? How do I put this into movement? What's the imagination? How could I have done this for each of you perhaps a little differently? Maybe I, I could have actually, like we did with the Limousin drawing, I could have said, okay, I want each of you to have your fence in a different place. What would have happened if this tree, for example, in my imagination, let's leave all the circles out and just see the curve, and we try to draw this as accurately as we can through all these points, And of course, we get a much nicer curve. I always tell the students they have to kind of go right off the page because it goes on forever. So this curve that we have here, what happens to the shape of this curve? Can you picture it in your imagination as the tree moves up. Again, ignore all the circles and the extra lines. Just see the orange fence, the orange tree. As the tree moves up and drifts away from the fence, how does that change the shape of the curve? Do you see it widening? Or the other way, I think, is easier. What happens if this tree moves towards the fence? Do you see that it starts to push in here? And the whole thing that's like this starts to do this, doesn't it? Yeah, it narrows up. Yeah. And so there's the possibility here. And so what I will do is all the students, I have typically this group of students has the tree two centimeters away. The next group has it four centimeters away, six and eight. And then I'll take one drawing from each of the students, similar to what we had up here with the limousine, and they can then see it. Of course, first I ask, in your imagination, can you picture it? And then in the next day, we see it with the different drawings. And, they can really, and, and we can transform this in many other interesting ways. And I'll just mention one way. What happens if this fence now, a straight line, becomes a circle? Can you picture what's going to happen to the curve? That's harder. And they'll do the drawing. So instead of having straight lines, suddenly all those straight lines become circles as well. So what happens as this straight line goes like that, what's going to happen to the parabola? Can you picture it? It's going to become an ellipse or an oval. Very interesting picture. And so we have this idea of the transformation of a parabola into an ellipse. If I can generalize, and I think I can here, for instance, with coordinate geometry, it's a wonderful study. Every student needs to know this. We do a lot of it. But there's something there that's much more fixed, isn't it? The form is sort of nailed down, if you will. Here's what it is. These are the calculations that dictate where everything is. Whereas I think here there's something much more fluid and imaginative here, which I think develops other capacities that's very different. I mean, Steiner talks about very much this connection between geometry and developing um, spiritual insights, if you will. This different kind of capacity that exists 
that is much more creative and imaginative, um, which I think also lends toward this idea of problem solving at a higher level as well later on. So I like this idea that in a Waldorf school, we introduce conic sections imaginatively through drawing and through experience. And then it's only later that are they introduced to this. When we do Cartesian geometry, and I didn't even, I didn't even list Cartesian geometry in the geometry curriculum. I think of it more in, as part of algebra, honestly. Um, but when we study Cartesian geometry, we go back and look at Descartes' original work on that. And you end up with, in fact, I'll show you this. Um, wasn't planning on it, but I will, since it came up. Um, if you were to go back and look at Descartes' original work and how he discovered Cartesian geometry, what would you expect? Wouldn't you expect page one, here's the y-axis, here's the x? I mean, it was a whole new concept, wasn't it? This idea of uniting, uniting the world of geometry and algebra together, which had been completely separate. And in fact, what I have here is a drawing that essentially is the only drawing that appears in Descartes' original work. It's essentially it. I filled in the curves here, but it's, it's, he didn't have the ability, one could say, or the desire to do a y-axis and x-axis at right angles. Why not? Well, part of it is he was inhibited by the fact there, was, there were no negative numbers. So his Cartesian geometry, named after Descartes, this is basically the only drawing that appears as he's introducing that to people. It's very interesting. So here's one thing. I just said how we're introducing this in eighth grade. We're not introducing Cartesian geometry until the beginning of 11th grade, which seems very late. Why? Because we're going back and looking at Descartes' original work, which is deeply philosophical. And in fact, it's an appendix in a larger book that uh, was really considered the first book of modern philosophy. Um, and so it is, it's a philo and I call the, the title of that course that I teach is called The Geometry and Philosophy of Rene Descartes. And we really go back and look at that. And, and what I find, and this is a good example of where things are different in Waldorf education, uh, and there are many examples of this, where if we wait until the students are really, really ready developmentally, and in this case, ready to really take in the philosophy of this, they really can get it at a deeper level and much more quickly. So when our students get to the end of 11th grade, one could argue, wait, you didn't do Cartesian geometry. What's going to be up with that? Well, by the time they get to the end of 11th grade, they've done so much Cartesian geometry, and they're so strong with it, it really isn't an issue at all. And they were able to do it, I think, deeper and with greater ease than if we had done it much earlier. When we're talking about proofs, uh, especially this real deductive proof approach to things, is very much 10th grade. So you Absolutely. And, that's, and that is really what certainly I experienced in, in my public school education. Geometry was primarily 10th grade. And, and it's all about proofs. And we very much do that here. We do it as a full main lesson and we do it as an entire semester. For right now, my advanced geometry class is working on presenting. Uh, they're doing proof presentations. So they're actually teaching the class. Uh, we had a student just a couple days ago um, do Archimedes' proof of how he figured out the volume of a sphere. And it's very detailed and very complicated. And I'd say that's one thing that we do differently than is typically done. We're not just having the students write proofs. We do that. But we're also having them present and understand and digest and have a sense of some of the greatest accomplishments in the history of mathematics through the work of Archimedes or Ptolemy or Euclid and to really look at how they did it to understand the historical context, which I spoke about also in my last lecture, uh, that this really gives the students a sense of what it really means to be human. I mean, if you really want to talk about it in a nutshell, what should education be? By the time a student graduates from high school or earlier, they should really have a sense through all of their subjects what it really means to be human. Artistically, history, uh, literature, mathematics, all of this, music, all of this. It teaches us what it means to be human. And it should be true in math as well.